can you please share your experience mm. of visiting Korea and how it led to bringing North Korean students here in Cambridge and what's your experience mm. of working with North Korean students? Um, we first went to North Korea in 2004. Um, that's partly prompted by, was prompted by the fact that Britain and Japan, Britain and North Korea, excuse me, have had diplomatic relations since 2000. Um, we have an embassy in Pyongyang and um, we wanted to look at the question of how at that stage, back in 2004, the North Korean government was trying to facilitate economic growth uh, and economic modernization. So we went, a small group of us, um, four individuals, to um, meet with North Korean officials, to talk about economic reform, to look at the experience of European NGOs that have been instrumental in providing economic training and humanitarian assistance. Um, and we also went to talk to academics in North Korean universities, um, to talk to uh, civil servants, bureaucrats who work in the Ministry of Education, and we were quite surprised, I certainly was quite surprised, by the receptiveness of the North Koreans for having closer economic, closer academic links between their institutions and ours. Um, so I visited Kim Il-sung University, which is their premier university, the Pyongyang Institute of Foreign Language Studies, which is where they train their, their best linguists, many of whom end up working in the government, Kim Chek University, which is a polytechnic university which provides technical training, particularly in economics and related fields. And the impression I had throughout, um, which has continued to this day, is that you know, the North Koreans, like their South Korean counterparts, have a, um, a deep interest in learning about the outside world, a real appetite for learning, um, a natural inquisitiveness, and... Um, that reflects, I think, individual preferences, but it also reflects the state's desire to um, use the acquisition of knowledge from the outside as a means of promoting the development of their country. And I think educational exchange, if it's genuinely um, reciprocal, can be a very useful way of minimizing the risk of conflict by creating mutual trust and understanding um, and better understanding of our respective positions. So I strongly believe that the sort of experience that we've had at Cambridge of sending people on short visits and receiving students from North Korea needs to be expanded and encouraged. But the current political climate makes that very difficult for obvious reasons. Um, I think a lot more could be done with other countries. There are many European countries, Sweden is one good example, that have a lot of experience of training North Korean officials. Um, the Germans, similarly, uh, Germany, of course, because of its own history of division, is often seen by both South and North Koreans as a useful model for how to resolve tensions between countries. Um, and German academic institutions have done, I think, really useful work in trying to promote academic dialogue. Um, Italy, similarly, has done a lot of work in this area. Um, so there's a lot more that can be done, but we need to coordinate. It needs to be done in a way that's more systematic and there need to be resources in order to make it possible. You know, it's always expensive training students. Um, it was our British government, through the Chevening Scholarship Scheme, that was instrumental in allowing those North Korean students, a small number, we're talking uh, about five individuals who've come to Cambridge and studied here, um, often for long periods of time, up to a, a year. And in that process, um, I think the training they received was useful. Um, they learnt a lot, we certainly learnt a lot, and we developed um, a rapport and a friendship with the North Koreans who came and studied here. Um, that was useful for them, for us. It also meant that in the course of being students here, those North Koreans uh, met and shared views with other international students, including students from South Korea. And it's easy to see what the benefits of doing that are in terms of creating confidence and trust. Um, as for my own visits to North Korea, the first was in 2004, the second was in 2012. Nothing, I think, is, is more effective than having on-the-ground opportunities to actually see conditions in North Korea. There's a lot of stereotyping that goes on. There's a lot of um, simplification when it comes to characterising life in the DPRK. And 
the the experience of meeting North Koreans and sharing views and seeing what material conditions are like in North Korea is extraordinarily useful. Um, and I think more of that should be done. Um, it's a way, I think, of dispelling preconceived notions both of North Korea and the West and North Korean views of Western countries. So we should do more of that. Um, and um, it needs to be done, of course, with the active support of other countries. Not, you know, academic institutions can do so much, um, but they need to feel that there is support, I think, from their, um, from their own governments uh, and that there are opportunities to expand these sorts of programs, which I hope will happen in the future. Uh, what do you think about the possibilities of reunification of Korea and what are Korean views on this matter? Unification has always been a long-term goal for both Koreas. Um, and there are different formulations of what unification might look like. Um, clearly, from the point of view of Seoul, unification is something that they would like to achieve peacefully. Um, and at different stages in, in South Korea's history, different leaders have offered different blueprints for how to get there. But the current leadership of President Moon Jae-in in, in South Korea uh, is committed to peaceful unification. Um, but we are a long way off from that again because the North has increased its military capabilities and we have two very different political systems, obviously an authoritarian North Korean regime and a democracy in the South. So I don't think unification is immediately on the cards, um, at least of the type that the South Koreans would like to see realized. Even if this were possible, if, if for example the North were to collapse tomorrow, um, the cost of unification would be huge far eclipsing the cost of German unification. And for many ordinary South Koreans, uh, particularly the younger generation, this is not a priority. Um, for older Koreans, um, including President Moon, whose parents came originally from North Korea, um, this is a real priority issue, um, but not in, this, in the short term. The key issue at the moment, of course, is dealing with the nuclear crisis. As for the North, they too claim that they would like to unify the peninsula. They see themselves as the legitimate government of the entire Korean peninsula. And the worry that many people outside Korea are increasingly talking about is that part of this strategy of military modernization is an attempt by the North to create conditions on the ground that will allow them forcefully to reunify. And the argument that, that uh, is behind that interpretation is along the following lines. If North Korea can so destabilize relations between Seoul and Washington, if they can split, if you like, the South Koreans from their traditional reliance on the United States because of fear, um, they may be able to um, enhance their military capabilities vis-a-vis -vis the South. Uh, an America that decides to withdraw its forces or to reduce its presence on the Korean Peninsula would leave South Korea vulnerable um, to a conventional or maybe a nuclear attack from North Korea. So. We need to worry about that. Um, it's not an immediate prospect. Um, the bigger risk, I think, in terms of military action on the Korean Peninsula is the risk of something happen happening, not through design, but through miscalculation. You know, the leadership in Pyongyang seems to be rational, and one hopes that um, President Trump is rational. Uh, there's always an element of ambiguity when it comes to, to Trump because of his temperament. Um, but I think the biggest worry at the moment is that we could imagine a scenario where conflict starts gradually and then at a low level and then escalates. What happens if there's a, an attempt to challenge South Korea by the North Koreans by using cyber technology, a cyber attack, or the shelling of an island, as has happened in the past back in 2010, or the dispatch of special forces from North Korea to South Korea? Um, one can think of lots of potential scenarios. And then the question is, how does South Korea, and more importantly, how does the United States as the senior military partner in that alliance respond? Can it be done in a controlled way? Can it be done to send a signal which isn't going to be misinterpreted by the North as the prelude to a full-blown attack, which would then prompt a response from them that would ultimately end up being devastating to both sides? Uh, do you think that developing nuclear bomb in the North can speed up South Korea to do the same? It's become more of the public discussion in the South. We've had opinion polls that say somewhere in the region of 68% of South Koreans believe that South Korea should now have its own independent tactical nuclear weapons. Um, so there's an appetite. There's an anxiety that feeds into this argument. 
conservative politicians in South Korea, including um, the main opposition party, the Liberty Korea Party, have said publicly this should now be a, a, a real option for South Korea. Even the current defense minister in the government of Moon Jae-in has said he is sympathetic to this idea. The president himself, President Moon, has been very explicit in saying no to this idea. Um, and I think that's because there's a recognition by people like President Moon that this would be inherently destabilizing. It would not, in fact, enhance security, but it would increase the risk of other countries going nuclear. And given what I said earlier about the risk of escalation, more countries in the region having more nuclear weapons, whether it's South Korea or Japan or others, is not a recipe for regional stability. Um, what we are, what the West, what America and its allies are aiming to achieve in the short term is some way of slowing down North Korea's nuclear program and its missile testing program, but ultimately finding a formula that can actually allow and persuade the North to give up its nuclear assets. I think that's unrealistic in the short term, um, but the idea that we should respond to this challenge by having South Korea go nuclear is, um, is a step too far at this stage. What do you think can bring the end to the American presence in South Korea and why is it important for the US to have a presence there? The importance of the American presence is that it is the very basis of extended deterrence. It what, it's what keeps the North Koreans from doing anything genuinely provocative that would um, lead to escalation. It's what keeps South Korea safe. Um, there are 28,500 American troops in South Korea. Um, as we've seen during President Trump's visit to Asia, three, um, three battle carrier groups, three aircraft carrier groups that were sent out to, to enhance deterrence. Um, American stealth bombers, stealth fighters provide the physical capability to challenge North Korea if it were to provoke. Um, and that message needs to be maintained as an effective m may way of deterring the North from doing anything that would destabilize South Korea. So um, the US presence is critical. Um, South Korea alone would not be able to fully guarantee an ability to defend itself against North Korea. Even though North Korea has many weaknesses in its conventional forces, it clearly has uh, a very credible threat potential, not only because of its nuclear weapons, but also its chemical and biological weapons, um, its missile batteries. Now this is a heavily armed country. So the American presence is there to reassure South Korea and to send a signal to North Korea. So I think the likelihood of the United States pulling out of the peninsula is, is very, very low, if not um, almost infinitesimally low. Um, but there will be some strategic planners in Pyongyang who argue that if they push hard enough, it might create a climate of opinion that says, yes, we should withdraw. And of course, in Donald Trump, we have a very isolationist president, a transactional president who doesn't have any... Uh, instinctive, personal, or even historical recollection that would allow him, or consciousness that would allow him to sort of argue for the importance of maintaining the alliance. For him, it's about um, what does this mean? How does it, this enhance America's interests? He's demonstrated that both as a candidate and in his visit to the region, using the threat of North Korea to extract extra defense spending from South Korea and also from Japan. Um, the personal ties that underpin America's alliance both with South Korea and Japan um, are a product of many, many years of sustained engagement between those three countries. Um, in the case of the US-South Korea relationship, of course, it's the legacy of the Korean War and the fact that American troops died to protect South Korea that's a key factor in understanding the historical significance of that relationship. Um, but if, again, if we go back to what I was saying earlier, if we look ahead a year from now, when North Korea can credibly put the United States in its own strategic crosshairs, what happens at that stage? Is it possible that American congressmen would say, we're not going to, we're not going to fight for Korea to protect our interests, um, or to risk our interests, essentially? Um, an America that feels less confident, that is willing to withdraw behind its own, its own, if you like, its own fortifications, metaphorically and literally, um, might be a country that could decide to go in a very different direction from its historical role in the post-war period. Um, and that, I think, would be extraordinarily regrettable. China worries that 
there is a danger that the conflict could spread beyond the borders of Korea, that um, a stray missile could land in Chinese territory. You know, the border separating China and North Korea is, of course, 800 miles long. Um, Korea itself, the two Koreas are, are relatively small countries geographically. The potential for the expansion of the war, um, if one thinks back to the history of the Korean War between 1950 and 53, of course it was the American decision to push north across the, um, the 38th parallel back in the autumn of 1950 that led to China to, to intervene in the war to defend the interests of its North Korean ally, which it still has a security treaty with, dating from 1961. That could happen again. Um, it's not very likely because China and, and North Korea are not on the same page when it comes to the current crisis. But the Chinese worry that um, a conflict, either direct aggression between the United States and North Korea, or perhaps more plausibly an effort to destabilize the North Korean regime through a combination of economic sanctions, political pressure, and maybe covert military operation, could lead to the collapse of North Korea, creating a security and political vacuum that the Americans with their South Korean allies would fill. Mm -hmm. At that point, the Chinese then have to confront the reality of um, rival political forces on their border in their traditional security space and that would be a source of alarm I think to Chinese military planners. So we know that the Chinese have explored the idea of contingency planning to intervene themselves if the conflict deteriorates. Um, but the difference between China and the United States here is about the best way of putting pressure on North Korea to try and make it more um, more willing to play a conventional role in international politics and to, to avoid these provocations and ultimately to stop it from continuing to push ahead so aggressively to develop its nuclear program. And how many foreigners are currently being imprisoned in North Korea? How many foreigners? I think that's, um, that's a hard question to answer. We know that there have been Americans who've been detained, of course, by um, North Korea, very tragically, of course, the case of Otto Wamblier, that um, was a source of particularly acute humanitarian concern to the United States, which has in turn prompted this recent decision by Donald Trump to redesignate North Korea as a state sponsor of terror. Um, not, I think, a very strategically sound move on the part of the US president. Um, further evidence, if you like, of the absence of any very coherent strategic approach by Washington for dealing with North Korea. Um, and there have been um, other Americans who have been periodically detained by, um, by the North Koreans, sometimes to extract political concessions from the United States, um, sometimes in response to actions you know, by individual Americans, of course, and other foreigners that have been seen, rightly or wrongly, as threatening the regime. Um, but uh, compared, of course, to the number of North Koreans, it's a very, very small figure. Are there any big cases at the moment that we should be aware of, but the majority doesn't know? Um, there are, I think, some cases of Americans who are still being detained. Um, um, I think a case of a humanitarian worker who has um, been uh, imprisoned for months, if not longer. Um, and these routinely are, are subject of discussion. Of course, the, one of the big humanitarian issues where foreigners are concerned is the status of Japanese nationals. Um, tens of, if not more, Japanese were abducted in the 1970s and 80s um, by North Korean agents for reasons that seem a little opaque. Some people have argued that this was an attempt to, to engage in identity theft by the North Koreans to uh, help them develop their own espionage networks um, working in Northeast Asia and further afield. Some have argued that the abduction of Japanese nationals was to enhance language training for North Korean um, agents. Um, but for Japan, the fate of these abductees, the so-called Rachimondai, as it's known in Japan, is a major source of political tension between Japan and North Korea, and a block on the ability to normalize diplomatic relations between the two countries. Um, uh, the Japanese government claims that there are at least 13, if not maybe as many as 80, if not more, Japanese civilians who have not been accounted for, who they claim were abducted by the North Korean 
uh, regime back in the 1970s and 80s. The North Koreans have shown no real appetite to provide any clarity on the fate of those individuals, um, many of whom we suspect have probably died, but in very um, ambiguous circumstances. And there is a lot of pressure on the Abe administration in Japan from public opinion, particularly from the families of those victims, to, to get further clarification from the North Koreans about the fate of their, um, their family members. And what are the most possible scenarios for the next 10 years? <laughs> Looking ahead is always difficult when North Korea is concerned. Um, there are, I think, I think probably three scenarios I would highlight. Um, the most extreme scenario, the one that I think everybody should be looking to avoid, is um, military conflict at some point within the uh, the next year or two. Um, it could happen any time as a result of miscalculation and escalation. Um, I don't think it's likely that the Americans are seriously intent on preemption, although there has been, I think, a shift in Washington, um, a growing chorus of opinion on Capitol Hill and in increasingly within the White House that believes that the military option needs to be seriously considered, even if it's undesirable, even, even if we know that the consequences of military action would be devastating for South Korea and possibly also for Japan, <coughs> and of course for those 28,500 American troops that are based in South Korea, not to mention large numbers of civilians, not just Americans, but there are 8,000 British citizens in South Korea, a million Chinese, I'm not sure how many Russians there are in South Korea, but there are a lot of um, a lot of people in addition to the the 10 million or so South Korean residents of Seoul um, who would be in the front line in the event of any military conflict. Military actions would be um, devastating, and there's no way that could be avoided, even allowing for the fact that the United States has a very substantive military advantage over North Korea. If a conflict were to take place, the Americans would almost certainly prevail. They would win. But winning at what cost? It would be devastating in terms of lives lost, in terms of the physical destruction to both sides of the Korean Peninsula, and the economic cost of this would also be huge. So a military scenario is not um, impossible to envisage. Uh, lots of people try and put a percentage figure on the risk of military conflict. I think that's hard to hard to do and dangerous to be to try and appear too certain. But um, I don't think it's far-fetched to say that there's a, you know, a good one in four possibility that we could see a military outcome happening in the next year or two. Um, so I, I would put it as, you know, as high as potentially 25%. Um, it, some people go higher, some people are more confident. Um, South Koreans who live in Seoul tend, I think, because they've had to live with the threat of North Korea, to try and um, go about their lives without worrying too much about this. So ordinary South Koreans are quite um, phlegmatic, quite relaxed about the probability of military conflict, although they worry increasingly, I think, about Donald Trump and his temperament. So the military scenario is a possible one, either involving preemption by the United States, unlikely at the moment, or more plausibly, as I say, this um, low-level escalation scenario. The second option, I suppose, is to say, well, as North Korea becomes more militarily successful, it will continue to push ahead to um, increase its nuclear stockpiles. We think it has probably as many as 30, if not 40, nuclear warheads at the moment. And extrapolating from its plutonium um, stockpiles and its reprocessing capabilities, both in plutonium and highly enriched uranium, it's um, feasible, I think, to imagine that by 2020, um, so just three years away from now, and certainly by 2030, um, we could imagine a North Korea that had a nuclear arsenal of uh, 100 plus nuclear bombs um, with an increased um, medium and long range missile capability. Um, that would mean that North Korea would be militarily extraordinarily strong and threatening not just to the region but also to the United States. Um, it's hard to see how the international community can allow that to happen. Um, we, we could also imagine as part of that strategy of military modernization, the North Koreans have threatened that they will uh, 
carry out a, um, an atmospheric nuclear test, a test of a nuclear device outside their own borders. So going beyond that um, September test this year that was so um, destabilizing to test a nuclear device in the Pacific. And that would be another major game changer, if not a very clear crossing of a red line that the Americans have drawn that might provoke in turn a military response from the United States. Um, I think it's quite plausible that North Korea will, if it hasn't already, be seen as a de facto nuclear power, um, which in turn will put real pressure on South Korea and Japan to themselves acquire a nuclear weapon. So I think the second scenario beyond the military, military solution is to imagine greater proliferation and a much stronger, more confident and potentially more aggressive North Korea. A third scenario is um, is kind of the best hope scenario at the moment, which is that the combination of economic and potentially political pressure, sanctions plus, um, will put pressure on North Korea and with added support from China and maybe Russia to, um, to come back to the negotiating table and to be willing to negotiate some sort of suspension or freeze of its testing program, both testing of its nuclear weapons and its missile capabilities to stop it where it is, um, or at least close to the current level of military capabilities. And that would be, I think, a very important and helpful outcome, because it would take us back from that turning point that I mentioned earlier, where North Korea is able to directly threaten the United States. So it would act as a reassurance. Um, but in order to get there, um, the North Koreans are going to have to be incentivized. They're going to have to be offered something substantive now, it could be a relaxation of the existing economic nation is based on those two principles, military strength and economic growth. If he can be persuaded to believe that um, agreeing to a freeze will open the door to much more substantive economic support from the outside world, it may help to realise that second goal. And he might be open and susceptible to that sort of incentive. Um, but at the same time, he's got to demonstrate credibly that he's going to enforce a freeze. There's a great deal of distrust at the moment and um, simply signing up to such an agreement is not in and of itself sufficient. It's a necessary first step. Um, so if we try and think about what a freeze environment might look like, it might also require um, military concessions from the United States. The Chinese argue that for what they call a freeze for freeze option, which would be a freezing of North Korea's testing capabilities in return for a freezing of US and South Korean joint exercises. The position in Washington at the moment is that that's not a deal that they're willing to sign up to at the moment. Um, but it's not entirely out of the question, I would say. And there are some in Beijing, and I think in Pyongyang, who would like to see that as a, as a viable outcome. Another way of incentivizing the North Koreans as part of such a deal is the idea of offering political concessions in the form of status recognition by giving North Korea something tangible that um, enhances its sense of self-respect and legitimacy and sovereignty. And that could be the establishment of a liaison mission between the United States and North Korea, perhaps the United States deciding to send a very prominent former politician as a high-level envoy, in the same way that Jimmy Carter, the former president, travelled to Pyongyang in the mid-1990s during the last major crisis on the Korean Peninsula. You know, we could think of a situation in which Donald Trump pick somebody very prominent, a former president perhaps, maybe even Bill Clinton, although I think that's extremely unlikely, to, um, to deliver a message and to open the door to negotiations. But that seems implausible at the moment. Um, what the Americans have, I think, been suggesting is that you know, the North needs to demonstrate its willingness to be a more responsible actor. And the good news, and there is a little bit of good news, is that North Korea hasn't tested any of its missiles or its nuclear assets since September 15th. We've had two months or so of relative quiet on the Korean Peninsula. Lots of rhetorical um, combative statements from Pyongyang and from the United States. Again, very unhelpful on both sides. Um, but the fact that the North Koreans have showed restraint has been helpful. But I think from Pyongyang's perspective, um, they worry that um, they appear weak in the face of the American decision to send those three battle carriers to the region in the face of more overflights by American forces close to North Korean territory, in the face of uh, 
um, rhetorically combative language coming out of the mouth of President Trump. Um, so one, a question we need to consider is, how long is Pyongyang going to be willing to show restraint um, when it worries that this will make it appear weak in the eyes of not only other countries, but very important in the eyes of its own people?